Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to uh, cross one's path when one embarks on this endeavor of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I do user experience design, and I teach workshops about it, and I coach it as well. And he coaches as well. And we'll talk about his coaching later on in the show. Uh, and we'll talk about maybe some of the comics that I make later on in the show. But for now, hey, Happy New Year, Rob. Good to see you. Happy New Year, Jersey. And Happy New Year, all the listeners, the leaners out there. It's great to great to be here. Yep, 2020. And um, <sighs> it'll come as no surprise to anybody who's listened to the show for any amount of time that we take as many opportunities as we can to do journaling, reflecting, and thinking about uh, experiences so we can learn from those experiences to take them forward into new experiences. And, you know, 2020, it just even though dates are an arbitrary thing for the most part, uh, they can be wonderful, um, what am I trying to say? Bench, not benchmarks, milestones to, to stop and consider. Um, they can create a sense of ritual for you to stop and consider and think. And uh, it just so happens that a new year presents this idea of possibility how does one engage the i push back on the, yes push i back. agree with everything you said you said except, except the arbitrariness except the arbitrariness because it's not arbitrary we are storytelling creatures and we use the calendar if you tell the story at the threshold of the change of the year that that calendar is arbitrary but you use the calendar the rest of the year mm -mm. <laughs> nope you're still using the calendar and it changes and we we use that tool and we use yeah. story and so there's this natural connection that's really strong that you totally don't need to do it's optional you, you don't have to worry about it but yeah. you know if, if you're interested you know joining us on some thoughtful exploration you know like yes once again we go into the <laughs> into the circumstance of <laughs> reflecting and trying to learn from that and it does affect you know we do that too and uh, to make future changes and stuff and totally respect at the same time people's mileage varies with that so yeah there we go there we go thank you for that um good no problem back. i just yeah i just get itchy sometimes so. <laughs> thanks for being so patient with New Jersey. Uh, so, so yeah, so it's it's the beginning of a new year, which means that this is a good opportunity to look back at our past year. And we thought what would be a, a fun episode, fun discussion would be looking back at our own um, professional adventures in 2019 as a way to model this activity of thinking about what we've experienced and what we've learned from it and how we might use that to tee up some thinking for possibly next week in um, terms of how we plan to go about approaching the year 2020. So taking a step back before we take a step forward. Uh, did I did I miss any framing for this one? Anything else that we need to, to load up before we hit the music? As long as we agree that the calendar is useful and we're good. Not only are calendars useful, but man, man, oh man. I mean, I, I posted a picture of my new Emergent Task Planner, uh, you know, on Instagram just <laughs> the other day. Because, like, you know, it's January 1st, 2020, and so now it's time to start a new one. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I live and die by this thing. And, as we'll explore probably in the second half of the show, I'm going to be experimenting with playing with multiple calendars this year. Actually, not only my ETP, but actually, ha like, do it like sort of like belt and suspendering things with a day planner. And I'll tell you why when we get to the second half. Oh, but, nice. um, can't wait to find out. I know just, just so much journaling and tracking that's going to happen this year. It's, it's a necessity. All right. Well then how about since, since Rob already pushed back so hard and pushes me to be as strong as possible <laughs> together. <laughs> okay. There's, there's the music that signals that we're now in the first half of the show. So, um, Chronicling our journeys in 2019, professional journeys, and, you know, sort of unpacking them, picking them apart a little bit and see what kinds of uh, teachable moments were buried in there. You want to go first? You're first in the notes. So. <laughs> well, there you go. It's been foretold. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so there's a, there, a big change happened last year. I, um, Let's see, a little bit of context. I'm someone who, when I embark on a professional journey, I, I commit to, you know, working with a client, working with, um, working as a consultant or full-time, wherever I'm at, I try to be as immersed and connected as possible. 
And sometimes that can be, um, I mean, sometimes you work with places or clients that you can be really, you know, you feel a strong connection, right? And, uh, so, you know, but other times it's a little bit more like, well, um, this is more, we're here for this project and we're not, not here to really, um, like, we're not going to be friends after this probably, right? It's, that's how it goes. Just, you meet some people where things work one way or work the other way. And uh, I happen to have been on this in, an interesting journey for like six years now, um, up until like whatever last April, May where I had been helping out this large retailer. And I had multiple times where I came, became very uh, just attached and uh, enthralled with the problems and the people I was working with multiple times, like three chapters is what I summarize it as. And that all came to a close. And that's, um, I am a quirky person where I tend to like when we introduce ourselves in the, on the podcast, we always say like, I'm a, you know, and we do a professional label, right? We're more than that. We're people, we're complex and all that. But gosh, darn it. If I'm not someone who I really do as much as I can say that I'm more than that, I really get tied into that label and, and, uh, and when, where I'm at and who I'm serving and all that kind of stuff as best as I can. And when I can't, when I'm not super proud of that, it's attention for me. <laughs> it, it gets me like, I got to keep looking for the next thing because I'm not feeling that grounded and, and, um, and just, just totally in, uh, in love with the situation. Right. So when that ends, uh, you know, that's, that was, um, it's a mixed bag, right? There's, um, that was a big start, right? So in some ways it's, it's like I, I had three big adventures each was about two years that adds up to about six years at this um, over this overall umbrella of one big organization. And that ended. And I'm like, mm, now what? <laughs> Cause it's not like I don't do my side projects and other things that are since some of them are experimental and some of them are, are, are like, well, I really want this to take off. It's a side business adventure. So it's not like I'm without something to do. But like one major thing about like, um, I knew, I knew like what, what might happen because of the, that third chapter, that third adventure, uh, the nature of it, which I can go into a little more detail. Uh, but you know, you just, you, sometimes you, you go up against a, a challenging situation and you think, ah, this might, this might land in the place where I hope. And it didn't land in the place where I hoped. Right. Yeah. So what do you do? Um, and I, I think the, to give a little more context, um, like, should I talk a little bit more about any of that? Like, yeah, what, please. What are you curious about Jersey hearing this? Like, um, what are the, well, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about like, when you, when you talk about like what this attachment means, like when you get, like, I hear that you're getting attached to the, the definition or the role but um, what what about those experiences like created that sense of attachment? If you could characterize what those experiences looked and felt like when you were there, oh, it's feeling amazingly helpful. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's that's one of the big drugs for for me. Where um, being someone who who is a huge fan of um, you know, like radical, honest, vulnerable collaboration, like, like really getting to know who you're helping and who you're working with, to, like solve problems, and uh, that's pretty amazing. So like that that was part of my first. Um, that first two years working at, um, working there where it was um, a place that was starting to change. They, this, this, you know, like large institutions are funny, right? Because they have so much um, compartmentalization and specialization and forms to fill out the form for the form <laughs> to get the other form or whatever. But they also, <laughs> and because of that, they mitigate a lot it's a risk and like they're, they're really structured to solve certain problems super well. Mm -hmm. And you know, the opposite of the individual small business person. Right. But then, you know, different trade-offs come with that. And some places at different points in time have succeeded in, in doing really, I don't know, innovative, neat stuff that helps them evolve. Right. I am, I was just a tiny piece of an overall movement, but I was in there at this movement when a large place was changing. And that was really fun because what it looked like was um, 
things like so one so, like, so someone wanted to build a system and put it into the world um at once upon a time in the early days it was really easy people just got together and talked about things and you know made you know agreed to to solve the problem and break it down in these different ways and then go do it and fulfill their commitments and it got done you know not mm -hmm. that exciting but then some point the specialization specialization and the bigness happens and it's like well we have to then talk to this other area that manages this thing that we need and it's all this kind of more complex it's more complexity to bring stuff together to solve problems mm -hmm. and i was there at the point where they're like yeah what if we tried it the other way again okay and so what so were you I, what yeah. were you what services were you providing in this environment because like i'm, so I'm was, picking up on like the, the the dynamic that you're describing but what was it that you were doing so so it started out with this small team that was there to um instead of asking for and receiving a large document to start work they just needed who needed the problem who needed a problem to solve to show up and sit with us that's it and we talk mm. <laughs> and then we uh, we would do design workshops and talk and, and, and form credible enough hypotheses, a lot of stuff that we've kind of talked about a little bit here to come up with essentially what would be a minimum viable product to move something forward for this, that, that, um, that uh, when, when we define this little project, it's an experiment and it has enough credibility from a few angles to where from the best that we know about the people we're serving and uh, how we could build it and what we need to have happen financially all that stuff it wasn't just sort of like well we have one assumption let's go build something right, right. we have one assumption and, and big and a budget and so no one can stop us from building something it wasn't that it was highly stoppable but highly collaborative and commun communicative right this process that would take instead of weeks and months days and then build something to test the hypothesis over a week or a few weeks instead of half a year year and a half or whatever things would take before right so it looked like we were moving at the speed of light <laughs> even though yeah smaller organizations and stuff were embracing this kind of um uh, collaborative work and doing things like design sprints and um test and learn type of applied research techniques right where we were just basically building you know websites and apps that help solve different problems or sometimes we'd come up with a different process to do stuff in the field. Anyway, it was, um, but it was defined and experimented with quickly and super collaboratively. So the other thing is like, we wouldn't just learn the thing and then make a big document and then go send it off to who are, or for someone to be performing it in front of the big, you know, the big um, executive audience or whatever. They were right there with us, right? Um, uh -huh throughout this this adventure so what what happened was every one of those projects was this little magical thing because even if it was hard even if things didn't work out the way we hoped everyone learned and at the same pace and in sync wow and yeah and it was pretty darn fun <laughs> to do that <laughs> and to be there to be an advocate for it to be to be encouraging like so like tensions can happen people there can be conflicts and people would might say like well but just do that thing and then we have to gently start exploring well why are we doing that thing and remember this is all about um learning in a very intentional way you bring up an interesting point how does that fit in with the principles we've already talked about do we need to change that? all that and in the end like any of those people who came to us with um their needs and challenges and we would go on a little adventure together um i'm pretty proud like we affected them <laughs> they affected us and we affected them that's cool so yeah that rocked um <laughs> and those, those kind of teams exist here and there in companies but it's kind of hard to make that um like your how you operate overall right so you may mm -hmm. be sort of saying like well we're exploring new territory and we there's too many variables. We're going to have to do some applied research in a certain way to help us then gate this problem, zone it off a little bit. So someone who is ready to then just sort of move into that space and can, can just keep on making it better, right? It's a different mm -hmm. nature of a team who's more about the production ongoing life of that little space, right?
Mm -hmm. And that's fine. A lot of stuff we would do, we would hand off. Um, anyway, that was the first adventure. And then I was, I, the hooks were set, right? And I was, I was really attached to like helping out in that way. Yeah. <laughs> and I was so, you know, I mean, I'm attached to my comrades, I'm attached to the, I mean, honestly, the organization for being brave and trying something like that and all the lots of stuff, the people we helped. Anyway, that's where the attachment comes from. Long walk sure. to that. Sure. But, but also, I mean, in there, I'm hearing that there was feeling like you're part of something that's exciting and um, bringing new stuff into the world with, with the resources behind it that you can actually, you know, bring daydreams and, and hypotheses and, and tests to life really rapidly, like doing something in a week instead of a year. Um, I could see how you get really attached to that idea too, right? Absolutely. And it, it, the willingness to, to, yeah, to, to just, hmm, to, to just set up that space and maintain it because the, the normal, um, in a large organization, the, the normal tendency is to, well, define the problem and staff it up to do just that problem. Yeah. And this was more about a, um, applied research and, and problem discovery and problem solving because you can't help in your day to day. And this is where like pet, um, pet projects come up where if someone who works at a place long enough and has enough connections can find a way to make deals happen and get a budget to do their pet thing. And they don't quite know all that, all that skill. It's amazing. And like someone can do that in large organizations yet that pet thing they carried with them that whole time it's still an assumption, <laughs> you know, like now they're not, so you, you don't have to go from like this pet idea to the big stage in one leap. You can, you can start small. And so like going on that learning journey is pretty awesome. Spreading the tools of, um, you know, human centered design and applied research and um, like sort of healthy development cycles. It, it's great because I've worked in lots of other places too, where it's like you, there's, there's not as much health or care to try to evolve in, in saying like, well, whew, yeah, the calendar says this, we committed to that. You got to work more. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so here we're, that was a constraint and we, we, we sort of talk it through and we, you know, some things would have to in an, if you were iterating to try to put something in the field to learn from and you thought you, you know, like, as, as each iteration happens, you're learning and adapting. And that includes like, well, maybe this feature didn't make it in, but we'll learn what that feature represents and what it's related to next round. Right. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, yeah. So, so many healthy things that were there. That uh, was Well, let's, can we talk about, it sounds like it was healthy and that you guys had a good um, environment for, setting up some principles and and testing ideas against those principles to see if it was something that you wanted to do. But were there any places where there was a mismatch of your principles and the organizations that, that might have caused some tensions here and there uh, in, in that journey? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so um, in some ways, um, so we were the part of that initial, what's funny, I don't know if we'll get to any of the other adventures. Uh, and that's okay, too. <laughs> Uh, but they were all kind of like this one in different ways. Um, okay. But um, so let's say you work in a large institution, you have a project you care about a lot, you want to get into the field, and you know that it can be done in a different way, but you're sort of locked into this other procedure that says, put your thing onto the pile. The pile will, will be addressed in the way the pile is addressed. And that means your turn is coming up eight months from now or whatever, right? And then you're someone who's in that situation who knows like, hey, that other team exists. Why aren't they helping me, right? And so, you know, then we got a lot of those kind of requests too, where it's mm. like, can't you just do this? And it's like, <laughs> well, maybe. Can you sit down and do a design workshop and <laughs> talk about it? And, and so, yeah, that, that kind of, um, we, it, like that team stuck to its principles in the way it delivered its service. We were not looked at as um, matrixed capabilities. We were a unit of capability, which was mm. to help people 
test and learn with their business problem. And so it wasn't like, oh, that's a nice uh, JavaScript uh, guru you got on the shelf there. Can I buy that? Um, I'm just going to walk off with this. And then all of a sudden we're like, hey, we can't get our thing done and test. What? No, that didn't happen. We were one unit. And overall, had the support to, uh, to pull that off. So yeah, tensions wow. exist. And that's natural and normal. And it should be that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, uh, the tensions exist because we're the weird ones right? That was the weird thing. Everything else was like how stuff worked and what led to the success of the organization. Mm -hmm. And so it's natural that there was uh, tension. And that's kind of like this whole um, innovator's dilemma thing. Um, What's the innovator's dilemma? Uh, like me. you can know how to operate in, in a new way, but nothing really functions. What led to your past success doesn't function in such a way that lets you easily adapt to the new way. Mm. So mm -hmm. What do you do? Keep doing the old thing well or sacrifice some part of it or all of it to do something new. And that is super scary. And that's why most businesses don't um, uh, have a, well, have a, like an easy relationship with innovation. Right. Yeah, the stakes are the stakes seem well, they certainly are. They're higher, right? There's there's more at stake. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh you you're you're built up and you're good at doing the things in the way that you're doing good at doing them. And that's what the machine does. So that's what it does. So I wonder Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. I please continue. Okay. Well, I I I wonder if we could just spend a few more minutes on this mini topic of innovation um, that you've sort of outlined or begun, begin to outline here. Um, so, you know, what does it mean to be on an innovative team and what kind of uh, frictions and challenges that, and you've started talking about that, about like people coming in thinking like, oh, well, you, this is how our organization works. So obviously we can treat you the way we treat everything else in the organization. And you guys had to make some, some stands, but what other kinds of, um, frictions, challenges did you run into as an innovative team as somebody whose job is come up with new stuff all the time. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, the, and so some of this too is, is like, I'm not saying anything. What's, what's interesting is that chapter is one of the easiest chapters I can talk about because we actually mm -hmm. were, uh, purposefully um, put in a position to do public speaking at that time, right? Mm. To, to share our journey and, and to talk about this stuff. So that's an easier part of my adventure to talk about. And that topic you, you're, you're, you're curious about is, mm -hmm. um, so how, um, let's see, so what challenges came up? And Let's see. How do I see, ask me that question again? I'm sorry. Well, I'm just wondering, like, you've got something in the notes here that I just thought was really interesting. And, and you didn't frame it as a question. You just framed it as like sort of like a note. Um, and I wonder, like, if you could expand on this idea with in, in relation to this idea of innovating, like what were some different um, terminologies that you learned gotcha, uh, gotcha. to be more more explicit about and more thoughtful about? So part of it's accepting the nature of like, we're a different creature in the overall ecosystem and trying to do that in a way that was um, approachable and welcoming and not alienating and arrogant and all that kind of stuff, which it would be easy to do. Um, and then I think, so understanding the nature of this stuff, which gets really like chin scratchy and, and philosophical and it's not, and certainly isn't territory. i I, that that I shy away from I I like that I like trying to come up with some like how can I frame this and understand it more and and so the um uh let's see so the idea that so some problems can be very um complicated and some problems can be very complex or some teams can be complicated some can be complex or what have you and in a uh, let's see it's just I've worked in companies that were brand new that day and also, you know, recent years and whatnot, because uh, I worked in places that were just startups during the first dot-com boom and all that. 
I've worked in, in uh, also, well, large institutions that was spawned off of other institutions that were, um, like I worked in a subsidiary of GM uh, for like the first nine years of, of, a chunk of nine years or so in my early my career or whatever. And so that was kind of a large institution taste. And then I went independent and, uh, and you know, gone back and forth and worked at lots of different sizes of companies. And, uh, and I, you know, I try to think about this stuff. So when I show up and, and I can help, I, I have some kind of, uh, when it's relevant insight to, to, to help with, well, how do we move forward with this thing? Or how can we sort of just meet this thing where it's at? Like when, when you, like if we're trying to build something to test and learn and we want to do it in a way that connects to the big organization, and then that was a that was a, a a challenge early in the early days. I'm pretty sure that's not a thing anymore, right? This I'm talking to like about between four to six years ago now, and or actually what? So five to seven, seven years ago, anyway, because mm -hmm. it's also been a while since I left. And uh, so forgiving how like th some things can be hard to be like, well, uh, we want to put a thing on this the, on on the the official site. That's this mini app that we could test and how could, how could we do that? And that's not a complex problem, right? So a complex problem has a lot of variables and how they relate can be subtle. And it's kind of, kind of like, like predicting the weather. And this is my characterization of it. I'm not a mathematician, right? I just like to think a lot about the stuff I build and, okay. uh, and, and find useful ideas. And so I guess I'm stealing people's tools, right? So if things come by on the radio or whatever, or the uh, podcast or, web article i'm like oh yes i've always wanted to say complex whenever things are like the weather <laughs> and how so many things relate in subtle ways and how and understanding it to a perfect degree is almost impossible but you can only understand like this this portion or one aspect of one portion that's a complex problem okay um where like a complicated problem is more like well this has a lot of uh, unforeseen, but maybe foreseeable parts that break other parts if you touch them and whatnot. This is a complicated mm. nest and tangle. Okay. Um, how do we do something with this? Oh, it's possible, but it's really expensive to do something uh, because of the... Um, and that's, that's my summary of it, right? And I think okay. we can put a link to, to it too in this. And so I don't know if that was useful. Like I just no, shared it, Like, did you go, oh, fascinating. Or did you go, what? No, no. That, I, and so if I were to like encapsulate or like do my best to like try to like pull out what I think were some guiding themes what you're describing there was it was a dynamic, really exciting environment where you felt really supported by both your coworkers and the institution for the most part. Um, and there was a really clear sense of mission and purpose behind what you were doing. Um, and your your um, principles were being um, tested yet rewarded at the same time. And while it would be probably um, not for everybody's cup of tea to work in an environment where it's like come up with new stuff all the time, because like it seems like, well, you're not really like stability probably wasn't there was less stability in the sense of what you were making and the service that you were creating. There was more ambiguity that you were dealing with on a day to day basis. But abstractly the principles and purpose and mission were very relatively stable does that did i characterize what you were experiencing there uh yeah a lot of the method was fairly stable too okay. and so actually part way along the way um i i interviewed i did i did well surprise i reflected on the experience and also um i was interviewing my collaborators to understand like what about what we were doing was working so well mm. right and it's not that complicated <laughs> complicated yeah. versus complex. What was working so well um, was uh, something that I've actually, I summarized and I published a manifesto, um, the Make, Share, Collaborate Manifesto. And it's like some of the principles in there just kind of go against the, like what would work super well on a team that had a lot of, um, not a lot of agency. And that, that like, let your space to make decisions, if, if it's super duper narrow, that make sure collaborate manifesto wouldn't, would be hard. Mm. I'll make you. 
anyway, but uh, but yeah, so right that right the the that experience uh, had a lot of a um, lot of things to get attached to, a lot of things to value about it, and yeah, even wrote a manifesto, which to me a manifesto isn't like a kooky thing. It's like it's a public decor- declaration of uh, principles, beliefs, and maybe a s- ways to go about something. I mean, to, to back you up on this, like as somebody who teaches a lot, nothing concretizes and makes your makes thinking explicit, like writing it out in that format, making that kind of declaration, knowing that, in, again, going back to my teaching guru, saying that, well, you know, you're not going to stick with this, right? Like knowing that this is a changeable living thing that is going to be informed by testing it out, by doing it, um, right? It's not like you're inscribing it in stone tablets and saying this is what we will live by and we will never change from this, right? Um, so, okay, it, and I have a feeling, you know, we might wind up mostly talking about your experience. I hope you don't mind, Rob, because I feel like this is this is really good modeling. I'm, I'm personally going to benefit from the, mod, the modeling exercise of exploring your journey. But now you characterize this experience, sounds like a pretty awesome place to be, and then all of a sudden it's ended. That is gone. Right. So... What do you do next? What happens after that? How do you find that sense of, well, I mean, I'm, I'm going to guess that like sense of mission and purpose were still there, but now there's nothing to, for it to bang against and give you some kind of like echolocation uh, in terms of, right? No, yeah, being funded is a pretty great thing. Uh, so I, uh, in that, that, third, that, that third chapter, I was... Um, well, I was leading the user experience and things related, so so both internal and external uh, to make it so there were components available to make products smart. Mm. And that's uh, that's its own interesting, fascinating ecosystem. And think about all the twists and turns and tangles in there about the uses of data and uh, coming up with uh, evidence-based and principle uh, infused points of view to recommend paths forward for that. That was pretty fun. I got to do that. And like, so there were the, so the stage changed, the team changed a lot of, um, but it was a, it was a new awesome adventure. And then that had this other thing that I, the reason I mentioned it, it was so on top of all this sort of applied research collaboration, uh, human centered uh, design facilitation stuff. Right. It would also added this, it mixed in this other thing that was like, um, yeah, I'm also, uh, what in, into spreading human centered, uh, in, in from, uh, internet of things capabilities. Mm-hmm. Right. And that was neat. Right. I mean, so we even talked about how, like I, I, I went to CES last year and all that and did a bunch of research and we talked about some, some of that, the techniques I used for that. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, so that was this extra, I don't know, roll hat thing label set of labels where now set free I'm like that's another thing where it's like you don't you don't just you can sort of just define your own things and have um but, but that's a lot to bring together right so physical product design um uh, building uh, like 3D interactive prototypes, which I can collaborate on. And I'm just like an early beginner for hacking electronics. So I got to ride along and learn from that stuff. But so it's like, that's a hat that I'm, I'm really not set up to wear, right? Um, I work well with someone with that hat, but like, mm, you know, I'm more like, let's, let's collaborate research and design and be intentional about what we're trying to learn and how do we make this work for our audience and also the business we're serving. That's my thing. And anyway, so I'm like, which part of this do I keep? <laughs> mm, mm, right. Yeah. Uh, I liked it all. Right. <laughs> which part do I keep any of it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So that, that's where I was, uh, I was all about, okay, what do I want to keep and why, what are new ideas? What are things that I believe in that I've been wanting to test? What are my new, what's, what's my new list of hypotheses that I can just now start to explore? Um, mm-hmm. So if I were to transplant myself, what are situations that I think I would want to land in? What would be nourishing to me and where do I think I could help? So I would define roles and start looking like, well, we're, who's got that kind of thing? Mm. And I would think of traits. I did some, um, 
I did an interesting exercise where I, I wrote out the um, things, I think it was like the things people would um, pay me for that I believed in doing. And in a way it was like a, almost like in, in, um, in interrogating myself about the, um, my coat of arms, like um, I, I wanna do what I love for a community I care about using tools and methods I believe in to engage in a sustainable trade. And so I had this big brainstorm of, um, I actually cut up my note cards and had these little, little, uh, little chits, little pieces of, of paper here and there. And I would organize them. And I thought, you know, and so what would emerge as I, as I come up with these ideas and I, that helped me form some hypotheses of like, what are some qualities of where I want to be? Where are the, what are the most important qualities? Right. Because mm -hmm. the place with all the qualities probably is something that I start. Um, which is yeah. kind of where things ended up. <laughs> <laughs> so then is this where we talk about like getting a foothold? Like how, how did you having, you know, done that kind of hypothesizing, guessing and, yeah. in, you know, categorizing and organizing your thinking, what, what, where did you start to get a grip after that? Well, as you're doing the stuff, as you're, it's, it's like, um, hopefully you're interviewing companies and researching them as much as they're interviewing you or more even. Mm -hmm. And out of that, I started to develop a, like, it's like some of the hypotheses I thought, I don't know, maybe not as, maybe not. Right. But then these other ones, uh, it just be, like, as I was, I, if I wasn't trying things, I couldn't sit and think my way through this problem. There's no, there's no meditation. There's no, um, uh, there's no music. The Dragon Ball theme wouldn't help. Nothing. Um, I would need to try stuff. And so I just kept trying stuff. One of the, and so, but then the things that I try, you have to notice like what's working, what do I like, what's resonating and mm -hmm. all that. And then, uh, so a lot of that was interviewing and, and exploring, but I also started to, well, build a workshop for, um, to, to teach on Skillshare. And that had, that, that felt different. That felt a lot different. That felt pretty awesome. And, um, and then like, so, so like that was a signal to follow, right? So let's, let, let's see, like, what do I, um, you know, what do I do with this? This was like a hypothesis on my list, but I actually didn't put a ton of weight into it. Right. I thought, oh, you know, these other things and I, all, all the scenarios I imagined as far as like being a, uh, a principal designer at um, like a super user centered design software as a service company. That'd be cool. Um, those kinds of things. And then what panned out, it was like, oh my gosh, this, this, um, you know, maybe, maybe it is building this, uh, you know, and teaching and, and focusing on that kind of thing and, and maybe unpacking what I've learned in the, in the last, you know, six to 10 years, especially, um, and, and start to, to share and, and serve through that. And so okay, that's the foothold, right? That's where things start to change, where it's, it's less about, um, it's like, when you're testing, exploring, maybe you have to do a lot of testing. Maybe you, maybe you don't. Um, but like for me, I, I needed to try a bunch of ideas and it really, con there was a lot of contrast because it was all of a sudden I was starting that. And then Kate was doing her research into coaching. And I, I was like, well, I'm, and that's one thing I'll, I'll help her build her business. That's what I will do. Mm, and mm. I thought, wait a minute. I like, I want to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> And so then that, and so there's, there's these, that's where the foothold happened for me is like I, only through trying and building things, building products, building, um, you know, uh, putting myself in situations to help others and building their businesses, mm -hmm. um, doing a little bit of consulting, getting called in on stuff and thinking about like, you know, get, you know, advising here and there. And I just, all of a sudden I'm realizing like, this independent thing is, I think, where I'm going to go next again. You know, like, I, I'm like, oh, I'm doing it again. Okay. And it felt right. And it felt like it made sense um, because, um, yeah, I, I went from, you know, the, the big event, the threshold to exploring. And then now I feel like I got a foothold and, and I'm just continuing to build from there. And what's funny along the way, too, 
is I did another experiment with Guitar Fretter, which is I'm still working on following up on that one. Because some products are have a short cycle, <laughs> some products have a medium cycle of development, some products have a long cycle of development, and this is a long cycle product. So it's like you can learn some sometimes you learn about um, like, I don't know, uh, maybe a type of role you want or a thing you want to build. Um, what you want, something you want to make. And that thing is not, um, not quick to make. Mm. But maybe you have a signal that it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. And so I got, I, I put Guitar Fretter on sale last summer and it I gave me a signal that, oh crap, a lot of people care about this still. Yay and crap because that's a hard one. Because <laughs> I'm like, if yeah. I could do that in a weekend, party, right? Seriously. Yeah. yeah. Boogie all over, so happy. Uh, it's, uh, I still, I love it, but it's not a short project for me. So similar problem, uh, with my journey last year, which maybe we could talk about in the second half when we start talking about like what we learned from our 2019, uh, yeah. professional adventures. Um, but yeah, I, I got, I started this year or rather in 2019, I started getting some very strong signals from communities that I care about. Um, and when I looked around, I think that you you coined the term, and I was telling you about these opportunities uh, off the show, and you were you were like, uh, "Oh, you left a trail of competence," and you turned around and said, "Hey, who left all this competence all over the place?" <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, "Oh, yeah, I do have a trail of competence that I've generated over the last decade, and I don't have as good of a formal presentation of that competence as I could, right?" Which we can talk and like, okay, what does that mean? What? How do you? How do you? Well, how do you take that experience and how do you turn it into something that's like, like uh, that amplifies the signal or refines the signal? Um, you want to talk about that in the second half? I would love to. That sounds great. Okay. I hope we're that gonna take was a, a useful exploration. And it wasn't, I literally, it's my nightmare if that, that whole chunk of the podcast was just me confusedly navel gazing and okay. just dropping so, pages of my journal in front of people. Ah, poof. That one fellow, uh, let me really read this one. Mm, applesauce. I don't know. <laughs> Welcome to Rob's Sad Diner comic. No, as a matter of fact, before we go to break, here, here's, your, here's your, um, your feedback and your reinforcement. Nate's in the chat and he says, Rob, you can articulate the creative problem solving process better than anyone on the planet. Thank you. Ooh, so th there you go. Great. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a break, about a minute and a half, uh, to thank some people who make this show possible, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about like learning from uh, your professional journey. Uh, before we do that, we got to thank some people, and those people are the folks who support us on Patreon. Yes, patreon.com slash art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. It's a way for you to say, hey, I believe in Robin Jersey, and I believe in um, the work that they're doing, and we want to thank five people who have been doing exactly that first up well let me get the list up so i can name the people um where are they oh there they are <laughs> first up the mysterious k thank you k for believing in us and what we do and jesse kaufman you can find jesse kaufman on twitter at jesse kaufman thank you jesse and Sp spencer hallam thank you spencer for believing in us and what we do and Ashley Knapp, thank you, longtime supporter of the show. Uh, Ashley, thank you so much. You can find Ashley on Twitter at Control Alt Lee. And finally, JS Taskus, thank you, JS, for supporting the show. And you can join them at patreon.com slash leanatory, where you will find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe space with fellow leaners. Also, people who support us on Patreon get access to special sections of the Lean Into Art Discord. Uh, there's three channels there that are only available to people who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. You can cancel any time uh, and check out all sorts of exclusive content there. Patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you to everybody who has been supporting us there. It means a lot to us. Yes. Thank you so much. All right. Um, how about I'll just heavy duty music for the second part because the second half is usually where we think about why questions why why and how why are we thinking what we're thinking and how do we think about this stuff when we're engaging with it what have we done what have we done uh so things we learned from this work in 2019 um very briefly I'll, we we talked about 
we talked about the uh, some, very like sort of vaguely. We talked about this topic. What episode was that? It was a while back. Um, what? Oh, vaguely. Two sixty one. Two sixty one. Where? Yeah, where this happened, and I was like, I don't know how to talk about this right now, <laughs> but I feel <laughs> big things. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it, coincidentally, in episode two sixty one, we were talking about how I was about to change my entire life um, because I had been living in Ann Arbor, Michigan for 15 years. And in that 15 years, Ann and I had built up a lot of um, work that was valuable to us. You know, Ann's work at the Ann Arbor District Library, us uh, working together with the Kids Read Comics organization to build the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival at the Ann Arbor District Library. I had over the course of seven years, been working as a teaching artist and building up the comics course there to the point where there was a waiting list for my classes. Like I, you know, had to constantly negotiate with the art center to, you know, they would be like, you really could teach five days a week here if you really wanted to. I'm like, I can't, you know, it's like it was, there was this ongoing tension between the comics illustration work that I needed to do, that I wanted to do, that I, you know, that you want to talk about defining yourself, cartoonist and teaching artist, you know, I, I find a lot of personal value in doing comics illustration, but then I also get a lot of value out of teaching young people. And now I have to give that up too. I can't do it anymore because it requires me, I have to physically relocate. I had to move to Columbus, Ohio. So, um, you know, a, a big chunk of, of my personal definition, identity as teaching artist was kind of up in the air. Was I going to do it anymore? You know, and I remember saying uh, to you, I was like, well, maybe I'm just going to take a year off from doing it because, um, you know, it's, it's probably going to take me a while to like find connections and find places where I even want to teach. Maybe I won't teach anymore. Who knows? We'll see, right? Like, like that was something I had to sort of figure out uh, anew. Um, okay, wow. Yeah, yeah, and um, and I mean, on the one hand, it was like, well, cool, I get to focus on my comics illustration work, but then, but then there was other unforeseen things, like in terms of the um, unforeseen, maybe I just wasn't looking, um, the disruption of moving, putting your house on the market, getting it ready to get it on the market, moving to another state, um, getting set up in a new location, finding a new place to live, um. And then meanwhile, finishing up the work that I was under contract for, like teaching work in Ann Arbor. So like Ann moved to Columbus first in February, and then I had to continue on in Ann Arbor through end of March. Um, and then the, the travel back and forth to continue with like uh, the selling the home and so on. Um, so that had like an enormous impact on organizing the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival that year, had an impact on my comics illustration work. Um, and I documented a lot of this on my own personal Patreon through the Fabulous Secrets microcast that I did there. But um, but if, if framing that up, or rather like setting that up to like talk about like what we learned from the experience, one thing that happened when I moved to Columbus that I wasn't I wasn't prepared for. And again, this might have been well, let's just call it naivete. It was naivete. I was operating in this headspace of, well, it took me 15 years to get to the point that I was at in Ann Arbor where like I was really making an okay living. Um, and I had like momentum on a lot of projects that I got a lot of personal uh, satisfaction and monetary satisfaction out of. It's probably going to take me at least five years to do the same in this new location because I'm an unknown entity there. Yes, I have all this evidence that I left behind me, but until I'm actually working with the person and they can see me, like I'm used to this, this dynamic of like, I have to go and perform in front of them before they see what my teaching looks like, you know? And I've, I've, I've had this experience enough in my life where I show up and I don't know if this will resonate with you or not, Rob, but I show up and they're like, Oh, that's cute that you make comics. And it's cute that you share that with kids. Cause it's nice that kids get to draw too sometimes. Cause art, yeah, it's, it's kind of useful. You know, it's, it's not being a doctor, but it's it's nice that kids get to do it, you know. Like there's like a little bit of that attitude. When I walk in the room and I go, okay, and then I do my thing, and then they go, oh, oh, you're teaching like writing, you're teaching design, you're teaching, you know, drawing, and you're teaching storytelling, you're teaching a lot of things at once. I'm like, yeah, eh, the comics is all those things, and I, and then I, you know, I, I politely bow and walk out of the room, um, and then they're like, well, can you come back and do that again? Like, yes, I'd be happy to, and it's going to cost you, you know. Um, so like. I was prepared to have to go through that only cycle. Fair. Yeah, is, it is. Yeah, which is only fair. Yes. And yeah, I've totally had that experience as well. Not with the teaching the comics and stuff, but it's with the but, whole, uh, you know, putting on, well, okay, we're having a meeting, right? We're just here to meet. Yeah, there's whiteboards, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, so it's these are nice little, oh, you got some forms here. I don't know, like 
oh, it's a creative exercise. Ah, oh, that's fun. I've been at the, are we going to trust Paul? What's up here? Um, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. It's like, no, we're going to intentionally unpack our problems and be open to different <laughs> possibilities and maximize how all of us have skills that we can bring if we set our roles aside and all that stuff. So, and people are like, oh, mm, mm. and then, you know, in the end, they're usually like, yeah, let's, let's do that again. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and so I was prepared to go through that cycle again, but then when I got here, I realized that because I had this evidence that I left behind me, there was a lot faster uptake with, from interested, uh, parties. And, um, when I talk about foothold, uh, it wasn't immediate, but it was faster than I thought. Like there were mismatches. There were meetings that I had where it was like, oh, our missions are not aligned, you know? And there were and there were instances where I reached out and I got no response, right? Like here's a whole big bag of evidence that I've just put in front of you and interest. I'm interested in talking with you about working together. We seem to have similarly aligned missions. Let's do something together possibly. And then just never responded, right? So there was like a little bit of that kind of reaching out and, you know, just echoing into the void kind of thing. But then there were instances where there were parties who came to me and it's like, we have very similarly aligned missions and let's do something like soon. Like let's do something like in January. Right. Um, and so that's when I get to my first big learning moment for me in looking at 2019 is, is that the evidence is there. I just need to do a better job of organizing it into a coherent story so that there's less mismatch. There's less, um, like one of the mismatches was is that somebody reached out to me to teach at the college level. And while I'm not, I'm certain that I could do it, I'm not certain that I'm interested in doing it, right? And so like when I had the meetings, I was like, ah, oh, yeah, this sounds like it could be cool, but it's just, I, it doesn't, I don't feel a thrill. Like the way when you say like, oh, do you want to teach 12 year olds? Like, yes, yes, I want to work in a room full of 12 year olds and talk about comics with them. But you know, not is excited, right? Um, and like, so um, I need to tell my story better on my website and in my in my resume to, um, to speed up the appropriate matches. Um, now that I know that I have something in my past that is, you know, has some utility in that direction. Um, Sounds like a really useful way to look at that. So I mean, it's it's the it's a classic thing of of you know publishing, and and uh, emphasizing the things that you wanted to want to do more of and you want to connect more with, right? That's mm -hmm. you know it's it seems it's, I don't know I, I I keep hearing that that kind of learning and and presented as you know this is something I learned and also presented as advice at different points in time and and it resonates but like it's just so easy to to include the the other stuff or to like i don't know just maybe want to say that well yeah but i did this other thing too <laughs> you know and and mm -hmm. then but that that does cloud it up it does um like how do you tell multiple stories well maybe that's possible but anyway what you say yeah makes a lot well of sense. i mean even though my title is cartoonist and teaching artist that 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 it oversimplifies something with a level of complexity that needs to be addressed Right. Well, it says teaching artists. So don't you want to teach college? Well, not, now that I think about it, no, not really. Not at least right now. I'm not super interested in that. But put me in an environment where I'm teaching kids. Yes, I am there with a thousand percent of my energy. Um, so and then um, I'll close my learning experience and I'll, I'll pitch it back to you is because I, I teased out this idea of um, playing with multiple calendars because calendars are real. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that is like a good problem that I have this year is like I'm already booked. 2020 is booked for me. Like I don't I've got comics work for the entire year and I've got enough teaching work that I'm I'm having to start like to use discernment and think about like like I just had to turn down my first like really interesting proposal where like a, a conference reached out to me to like say like hey would you like to do a, a presentation or a conference about about writing and drawing comics. And I was like, oh, that's so cool that somebody, that I'm on somebody's radar and that they want to pay me money to come talk to them and everything. But I just looked at the calendar, looked at the time required, and I was like, I can't, I can't do it. I'm at capacity now. And that scares me in the sense that I don't, I've dropped the ball once on a teaching gig where I didn't put it in my calendar and didn't remember that it was, I double booked myself is what happened. That's what happened. I double booked myself un unwittingly. And then like, it was a month before this, this teaching gig that was like, 
you know, way north in Michigan. And I had to decide between two gigs, which one am I going to go with? And I had to let somebody down. And when I talked to that person on the phone and I heard the disappointment in their voice, not because like, oh, I'm the great Jersey Droves and the kids are crying, but just more like I made their life unnecessarily difficult because now they got to book something new for this time slot, you know? And when I offered to like, like do a follow-up visit for free and they were like, that won't be necessary. And I was like, oh my gosh, that sucks. That really sucks. I never, ever want to do that again. Um, so I want to make sure that like I don't, drop the ball on any of this uh is it complexity is this complexity or comp it's complexity when you have this many different like i'm going to be operating in like multiple channels at once between my comics deadlines my teaching work and my advocacy work um so this year i'm going to experiment with working with my etp which is sort of like my on the ground tactical day-to-day what do we got to do today and capture some reflections of what happens and i can pull it up Right here's today so far, right? Um, you know, write out my items and then track the things as they're happening. So, but then for a broader view, I thought maybe I would do it entirely with digital calendars. But then I thought, eh, I need to see something that's like actually like you know spread out in front of me. As I'm a, knowing my limitations as a visual person, so I actually got like a day planner, a day planner, Rob. I'm at that point, and um, this is. Uh, it's got like, you know, it's got like the year sort of spread out month to month so I can mark things up, you know, on there. But then also it's got like what's happening this week, right? It's got the weekly breakdown and then a place for notes. So I'm going to have a digital ca- calendar. I'm going to have this calendar that's never going to leave my person and then my day-to-day tactical approach to try to uh, manage all the different jobs that I'm doing this year. Uh I don't know if that was useful or anything, but I know that's a, that is, that is useful. I, I'm uh, just, that's a lot of calendars. Um, it is a lot of calendars and it feels like it's a lot of work, but I'm just, I'm so worried about, I'm, I'm going to be teaching three regular teaching gigs this year, um, which are going to be multiple weeks and they're going to overlap in different ways. And while my digital calendar will ping me on my phone, I just want to make sure I don't double book anything because now I've got like a lot of days in the month that are like called for, right? And then this other new gig I'm going to be doing is going to require a lot of meetings. I'm going to be taking a lot of meetings for it and those meetings may fall anywhere on the calendar. They're not scheduled, right? They're not like, okay, every week at this time we meet. No, the meetings could happen because there's a lot of different parties that I'm going to be working with. So I want to make sure that I know exactly what it like the next two months look like so that when these meetings pop up, I can place them uh, or I can, I can report to the group what my availability is uh, without fear that I'm accidentally overlapping something else. There are calendar tools that let you integrate your electronic calendar availability with the planning of a meeting. Okay. Such as, yeah. So, give it to me. for instance, well, for my coaching business and for you know, for for Kate's as well, um, we use a tool. And this, uh, let's, let's see, I don't know if I talked about this. Um, I I did a huge comparison of different uh, different tools that we were going to use as far as um, you know, making this business work without a lot of without too much overhead and cost, but also you know, just a, just enough to like make it work logistically really well, right? For Kate, this is a side gig. For me, it's I, it's kind of a it's, it's mixed in my pool of my main gig, right? And I don't want to miss any meetings and have that kind of problem happen, what, what have you. So um, it integrates with my Google Calendar. So whenever something comes up, like if, if a, an appointment gets scheduled, I'm not available to book as a coach, right? Okay. Just poof, goes away. Um, and there's other tools that, that do that as well. Uh, Calendly is one that comes to mind. And I'm just going from memory here. Um, gosh. And I, th- uh, do, 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 do. what's the one? Ah, uh, it's not coming to me. There's one that's pretty good at the whole group meeting thing too. It's, um, mm. oh, it's killing me. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but um, yeah, should be an easy Google search. And, and you can integrate that with, with, your, with your existing electronic calendar to reduce the risk of having something clobber or attempt to clobber something else. Yeah. Some okay. Unrequested advice drop off there. Here's a package. 
Rap, rap solves problems. This is like this is something that happens in our personal conversations all the time. As I start describing a problem, like I think I'm gonna do this to solve this problem, and then usually you have like two or three things else that I can try. So I've come to rely on that, Rob. So thank you. Um, <laughs> he shakes his head. It can be I, I, as long as it's. It, I'm trying to help, and not it's not not to be insufferable and whatever. It just it's it's close to something that I worked on, right? So I'm like, hey, you know, yeah. food for thought. Okay, good to know. Um, okay, so let's let's continue on in the second right. half with what did you learn from this work in 2019 and this 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 big experience you had mm. well i think i'm still unpacking some of my learnings from 2019 there's going to be more than this but a few um really uh stand out the uh one of them is uh like timing, you put a product into the world. So I got to live this day in, day out and in, in a variety of ways in three different gigs in the last you know six years, but also before that too, like consulting, helping, um, helping clients put changes, put things into the world, marketing campaigns, whatever, new, new features in their sites or apps. But then really living that when it's like, oh, here's a new product idea or a new way to interact with the audience and how like day one, you put something into the world, what's the awareness of that? What's the potential, like who is your, who is the market that you can reach right away? Um, and who is like easily reachable and however many, like what that looks like, the size of your audience, how you can um, put something in front of them and all that and grow awareness of the thing you made. Like that's huge. There, there's like, there's a conversation, like a product that like I've learned this lesson, like a product isn't sort of an announcement of here's something helpful. Boop run you know right and then run away like that product kind of just languishes and uh it needs this sort of conversation to happen around it to support it whatever and i so i really got lots of like like fresh exposure to that for my own personal work um and it didn't feel that frustrating it's like yeah okay i get it like you know like this is it's familiar territory now. I think that would have been more disappointing earlier on as far as like the slow, like slowly watching the amount of students tick up in my classes in Skillshare, right? It's not as fast as I would hope, right? But, mm. it, but, the, but it keeps marching on, it keeps marching forward. And that's, uh, and that's good. And it makes sense that it marches on in the pace that it does. Um, because of that's just a moderate matter of timing and uh, product market fit. So if the, even if the audience is aware of it, is, is there sort of that, that connection? Does it communicate well? Am I um, like, sometimes I'll, I'll retitle something to make it just more concise. Cause sometimes I generate long titles. Um, so there's this, this two, this, I guess accepting of that dynamic has been like, a, I don't know, like of, or becoming not just accepting of it, but sort of embracing it and uh, in, in a fresh way. Um, mm. And it's, uh, and things are moving forward and I feel good about that. Um, just got to keep at it. And that's uh, pretty important. Just continuing to, to nurture these different endeavors, the making the game, the teaching, coaching, can I be somewhat um, remedial for a moment and ask if you have any tension in, in, uh, with regard to sending that signal out over and over again, feeling like, cause like this is something that a lot of people report, I know I feel this sometimes, of the sense of pestering people, that you're constantly hitting everybody with the sales pitch for your thing. Uh, I look forward to getting to that point. I have not <laughs> felt like I've pestered enough, okay. to be honest. I'm, I'm still working on having more frequent um, marketing stuff occur. And I'm, tr I'm actually, one of the things I'm working on too, is having the, like sort of a, a natural ecosystem of products that they kind of reinforce one another overall. Like the... Um, like teaching things related to user experience, design, and um, creative process, right? Those mm -hmm. two go well together for me. And then writing, well, this is something I, like a second learning. So I'm trying to do service-oriented, service-minded marketing. 
um, if something comes up that is a message about a product, hopefully it's coming up not in a uh, repetitively annoying way. And hopefully there's some aspect of it that's useful. So maybe it's paired with a nice drawing. Maybe it's paired with uh, a useful link. Maybe it's on sale. Maybe it's um, integrated inside of something else that I like a podcast, maybe <laughs> mentioning a product where like the, you're getting lots of value. I'm also mentioning this other thing I make that I'm looking mm -hmm. to engage in trade and do hope that this, you know, like we do ads on the, on um, art, um, lean into art. So mm -hmm. starting to do ads in the other places that I podcast too. Mm. And so that kind of thing. Also noticing like, uh, like recently the, the process of learning and adapting, it just doesn't stop. It's like that initial getting a foothold. I don't think that, that, that you're, I think I'm always getting a foothold now. Yeah. So the, like recently I realized that um, there's part of the development for, development for workshops and talks. Like I have a couple talks scheduled for next summer and some of the development for that I'm planning on making workshops, which is a product. It's like, there you go. Boom. I'm making a sellable product to do this sellable talk. Right. That's pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. As far as, um, um, complimenting complimentary pieces of my business, but then there's a step, there's a gap before the, that piece of, um, material, um, and where I'm developing ideas and stuff. So I realized like I could be doing articles. And mm. so then I added that to, to what I'm doing, but it's still, uh, it's part of the whole, um, teaching and coaching and, uh, that, uh, so yeah, I just, just before the end of, uh, 90, uh, the end of last year, I did, uh, I published my first article on Medium. Ah, what's your what's your Medium address? Just Rob, Rob Stenzinger? Stenzinger. Yep, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, it's uh, and th that's all about the um, just one of the things that I find myself in. in, in I've found myself in multiple times in my career. It's like when you're there at the beginning of a team starting their design journey, and uh, because sometimes I've in a way it's, this is me making, uh, and exploring my thoughts about reacting to stuff others say online where it's like, Oh, you know, I've seen experienced designers be frustrated at companies for not knowing about design. And for me, it's like my whole career. It's like, it, I, I'm somehow I'm there when they're just, they're either picking it up or picking it up again. And, um, Sure, there's some challenges with it, but it all kind of makes sense. So that's an article just advocating and encouraging that, like, it's kind of neat to be there when people are starting out with their design journey. And we will link to this in the show notes. I got it up on the screen right now, but yes, it is the, the article is being there when a team is starting their first design journey, as Rob said, medium.com slash at Rob Stenzinger. So, so does that it, make sense where it's like that, where it's like, there's a piece that I'm like, well, I'm kind of doing this anyway. And yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, and it isn't quite selling your sawdust, but it's just, it's repackaging something that you've already, that you're already doing in another format in order to create a heartbeat or a signal of, well, again, like perpetually demonstrating your competence to have, give fresh material for people to come across your competence, to come back in to where you want to engage in trade. Does that... That I've described that 100%. well. 100%. And it has this other additional benefit of it can also make money because I choose to, I chose to publish these things in a, um, a, pub a publishing market space. Mm. So Medium is a place where you can potentially get paid to, to mm. write and publish. Um, Neat. And, and it's a place, this goes back to something that like it was a hypothesis I was testing with the Boulder and Fleet webcomic years ago is, okay, where can I put this thing? in a place where people readily share images because I want this thing to be a place where it's easy access, where people are already looking for images and it has, it has some kind of capacity for like re redistributing that image so that more people can find the thing. Um, and that was why I decided to have a Tumblr site back then. Um, you know, my thinking is, is changing as I experiment with different marketplaces like line webtoon or tapas.io um, still haven't done any kind of like rigorous testing of uh, with my current webcomics projects, but that will be, 
I'll be thinking the way you're thinking. It's like, well, how can I take something that I'm already doing and continue doing it in platforms where people are um, engaging with this kind of stuff? Um, and Medium has and that neat thing where, it. and paying for it, yeah. Medium has that neat thing too where you can like take a really interesting quote and share it on Twitter with a link to the Medium article. Is that, am I remembering that right? Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. So that's and something. I'm functioning. just thinking, I forgot to set my article up with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think others can go along and do that. Well, but I've seen how other, how artic articles seem to be sort of pre set up with a, a shared quote, a shareable quote. So, yes. Yeah, like the, yeah, the quote, good. usually the part in a magazine article where it would be like a line from the article in big red type that interrupts the, fl the reading flow of the article. Right. Mm -hmm. But you set yeah, that up to quote. be so. Yeah. So and, and and it makes it it, it uh, I think the thinking there is it it removes some of the friction of sharing because now I don't have to formulate any words to explain why I'm sharing this thing, right? It's got a pull quote yeah. built in. For better for worse, UX designers in the system taking away friction. To be like, just slip on that banana. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, well, I think I think that's a pretty. I think this what you described there. It's funny because it, it feels like advice that has been passed around since the early days of web comics is go to forums, talk with other people, start conversations to like demonstrate who you are as a person, so that, and then make sure that you have like the link back to your web comic in those forum posts and everything. And and I remember at the time it felt like oh god, I just I want to just want to make comics, so I got to do that too. Um, but it feels like you have a more holistic sense of what that means to con continuously put that signal out there, both in the way by putting it in places where you have the potential to make money off of that content and create a mechanism for people to find you. But then you're also repurposing and generating content that can go back into making new products that support one another. I th that's a great way to put it. It's it's sort of um, I realize my end goal is to not just engage in the endeavors that I um, that I like and I associate with the creative process and I feel competent at. I want to also uh, help people with that. And how that looks isn't just up to me. So I can come up with mm -hmm. what I think is a pretty um, clever, um, like strong hypothesis driven product. But yet, the market may not be you know in the right place for that. Mm -hmm. That's, it is what it is, right? That's, that would be complexity. Um, and how do I face that complexity? Well, I can adapt. Like I can say that I am attached to, um, you know, being of service and honing and growing and, and serving with my skills, but what exact form that takes, I can, I can continue to flex and find where the, like where me and the market meet. Mm -hmm. And that's, what uh that's what that you know finding a foothold is is in and in, in just trying to recontextualize that thing of like well it sure feels um feels like this burden to like have to do that for your projects but like is it a have to or is it a get to because that's where you're really tending to your project more and if you're inclined to do that then then you probably have more of an inclination to be like an independent creator if you're not as inclined to do that then you may not want to be an independent creator. Yeah. And both are great. <laughs> both are great. Both bo both are are uh dangerous and both are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> dangerous, <laughs> dangerous, wonderful, satisfying. That's the <laughs> making stuff soda. <laughs> Make stuff soda. Ah, uh, you can find it on the shelf right next to Rock and Rye and Red Pop. Okay, uh, are we at final thought time? I yeah, I think so. Okay, let's go. So, on. how about in about a um, minute or two, we're going to conclude with some kind of final thought that wraps up this thinking that'll lead us into the next episode. Um, but before we do that, we have to thank some of the people who make this show possible. And those people are us. We make the show possible and we make stuff that we hope you will engage with. If you find these discussions valuable and encouraging, um, please go do check out the things that we make that, that inspire these discussions. And the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire, which is a graphic novel that I made, uh, what, 
a couple years ago. It's, it just came out in print last year in 2019, and you can find it at books.jdros.com. It's a 92-page graphic novel uh, telling the story of a bear and a bird who go off on adventures together to become the most successful adventurers of all time, and the bird seems to think that the way to do that is to defeat enemies. Is that is how you know superhero movies work? There's a bad guy and a good guy, and usually some kind of battle involved. But Boulder the bear thinks that uh, making friends is a much more valuable endeavor, and that's the best kind of adventure for all, as, of all, as far as he's concerned. So there's a tension between the two characters as they both argue about the best way to go on these adventures, and they meet all sorts of different kind of weird fantasy creatures like girls who are made of minerals who eat precious metals and take over mines from miners and uh, how do they solve the problem when one wants to beat everybody down the other one wants to shake hands with everybody it's at books.jdros.com hey rob um do you want to talk about the thing that you make the the coaching that you do the new workshop that you guys came up with uh yeah let's let's talk about uh I'll mention the coaching and the workshop. So okay. what I have for you is, okay, you're at the beginning of the year. Maybe you believe in calendars. Maybe you don't. Either way, <laughs> you might have an urge to address some goal planning. And whether you are enthusiastic about it or annoyed with goal planning and all that kind of stuff, it's, um, I think I have a pretty useful workshop for you. Because really what it is, it's six or seven, depending on which version you get, uh, some design activities to just sort of frame up the things you're thinking of doing and uh, do that in a robust way. And then now you should feel like, so like I see a lot of people get attached to um, like resolutions are awesome or res resolutions suck, or I just have a phrase for my year, or I just have this summary story in a way like, we say you don't have to be attached to just one. You can have all that. And that can be an intro. Each one of them provides a different perspective on coming up with and describing your intentions for your year ahead. Um, and that's what we have for you in a workbook and a workshop. Um, the um, Both of them were uh, co-created by me and uh, my collaborator and, and wife, uh, Kate Shield Stenzinger. Uh, we made the Where Next journal. That's a You can get that on, without the workshop. Um, you can get a free version. Just go to gum.co slash WNXTJ. And there you go. That's uh, that. There's a free version. You can just pick it up right there. Uh, there's that's that's only 10 pages. If you want the more robust, it has some some um, some setup and warm ups and encouragement and stuff in, you know, for every one of those tasks plus our, our design activities plus one more. And then, well, then you'll get the 30 page one and that's only five bucks. Then there's the whole workshop that like, if you don't want to go through this alone, you want some encouragement and description. And then Kate and I are there, right there with you to introduce each one of those sections and the overall experience as well. So you can go to gum.co slash GSUDS, or you can search for my profile on Skillshare and it's for you right there. So if you already signed up for Skillshare, boom, you can use the where next journal and you can use the workshop goal setting using design plus storytelling. With seven creative and analytical exercises designed to help you identify and describe your best future. So, yeah. um, yeah, we did. We did an episode where Rob did some coaching with me, um, where during uh, my Inktober challenge, and I mean, it's amazing how in the weeds we can get with our creative projects when we're just trying to, you know, make them happen. And sometimes just having a a, a person standing outside of you who can just give you like a few helpful nudges to help reveal to you things that you that excite you about this thing again that you didn't even that you didn't realize you weren't looking at or helping you figure out like, well, how do I define what I even want out of this? Like, I think Rob, you, you and I have talked a lot about like what we want out of our careers um, on this show. And we've done enough thinking about it that we can articulate it pretty clearly. But, uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't happen overnight, right? There was a lot of guessing and, and hypothesizing that happened, right? And sometimes help, having an extra person in the room who can like give you a few helpful uh, exercises and questions can get you there uh, a lot more effectively, at least in my experience, that's the case. Well, and some of it too, it's, uh, well, and think, yeah, co coaching is, is that kind of thing. Someone is listening really deeply to what you're working through and 
helps you with that that path that's important to you with you know where you're going to move forward and then that that last part that can be very very useful your style and interests but some kind of accountability partner as well where you could say that oh yeah now i have this idea of like framing up where i want to go and the thing i want to do next to make that happen and I want to talk about that at our next meeting, or I want to give you a text and then I want a high five, or I want you to ask me a thoughtful question about it when I put this into the world, whatever it is, like some kind of mm -hmm. accountability thing that can really help a lot of us uh, clear, the, clear the ambiguity. Cause like, you know how to work on your projects probably. So, you know, what's, what is kind of stopping you? And sometimes it's that missing piece of someone to just be there when you do it. And mm -hmm you know, and, and, and connect and relate, whether it's critique or high five. So yeah. coaching is, it can take a lot of, a lot of different forms, but primarily it's, it's that kind of, um, you know, listening thought partner who is, is there for you. And uh, that's available. Um, you can sign up with, with, uh, with coaching that my business has two different coaches, myself and, and my wife. Uh, you can find my coaching at uh, robcoach.me. And you can find Kate's coaching at mycoachkate.com. So robcoach.me or mycoachkate.com. And if, well, the other thing, we, the last thing we want to point you at is the Lean Into Art Discord. Yes, Lean Into Art now has a forum where you can log in and talk with fellow listeners of the show and me and Rob. There's three public channels. Uh, the, the invite link will be in the show notes for this episode, by the way. I, I don't think this is something you just look up online. I think you have to use an invite code to get in. Um, but uh, what, there's... Uh, Topic requests, you can request topics for future shows, you can comment on past shows, uh, and you can also post about like whatever creative challenges you are currently undergoing in the Challenges Quest channel. And then there's three channels, as I mentioned earlier, for people who support us on Patreon. There's a social channel to just share what's going on in your life, Gentletown, where you can ask for a high five on a project you're working on, and then Castle Level Up, where you can post some work in progress and access the Lena Twart Brain Trust of fellow leaners who care a lot about telling stories with images. And once again, that's the Lena Twart Discord. You can probably search for it in the Discord app. Um, but again, the, the invite code will be posted in the show notes for this episode. So thanks to everybody who's been engaging with us there. It, it's been fun uh, interacting with you and talking about the Mandalorian, uh, amongst other things. <laughs> so. Yeah. Amazingly, right. fairly spoiler free. But yeah. Yeah, actually. Everybody's been really respectful about that. It's awesome. All right. So final thought time. Do you have any ideas on how we might wrap this one up? Well, I, I know you teased in the beginning of the episode that in, in a way this, this in the, in our next one, next episode are, are sort of a, um, maybe a process of, of looking back and looking forward in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, how, how much, um, and, and since we're wrapping up the, the sort of uh, learning from professional adventures uh, thing, like how much have you looked back and do you intend to do more exploring or, or mining of your experience from last year? How do you intend to go to do that if, if, if you plan on doing it? So one thing, a hypothesis I have for this year that I need to test, and one way to effectively and thoughtfully test it will be to go back and mine my past experience because I'm actually, at, I've got, you know, two of these um, emergent task planners filled up with all of my 2019 experience. And there's a lot of data in there as to when I worked on things, how much time I spent on various things that I did, what interruptions happened. Um, and so a hypothesis I have is that I wonder if creating a more rigid routine with my schedule is called for, if it will be necessary with this year. Now, that, that hypothesis comes with some fears because one thing that I have celebrated about my, my work life um, in the past, I want to say 10 years, is that it's very flexible. Um, I can move things around on my schedule uh, all the time. And what that can mean sometimes is that there are days where I'm working from 9 a.m. till midnight. But am I? Not really, because there's all these big breaks in the day. There's a two-hour chunk here where I did like some personal stuff. There's another couple-hour chunk here where you know I spent time with my wife. Um, so I'm not. the work gets distributed over a broader period of time. Um, but the amount of 
challenges I'm taking on this year might necessitate that I be a little bit more rigid in like, okay, this four hours is untouchable. This four hours is for drawing comics only. Um, and I can't let other things infringe upon that. I can't be flexible anymore in order to make sure that I get this work done. Um, in order to do that, I have to have a really clear estimate as to how much time I need to do the comics projects that I want to do, which will require me to go back and look at how long did it take hour for hour, page for page to do the amount of pages. Like look at the amount of pages I want to do, break down the, the math and how many hours that will require, add some more hours on top of that, and then maybe block out. Uh, so like in order to like really get a sense of what I need, I need to do two things. I need to map out what I want to accomplish by uh, December of 2020 and then figure out how many pages that requires, how many hours that took me last year to do, and then try to assign some times that are, you know, uh, what, what would you call those times? They're just un untouchable times. Page productivity. Well, sure. Dedicated productive time. Yeah. Right. Production time and and make that non negotiable. Um, that's 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 something I'm thinking about this year. But my my fear is is that I will resent it <laughs> because like another thing about my flexibility that I enjoy is that that flexibility can mean that emotionally, if I don't feel like doing that activity right now, I could put it towards later and I could do a different activity that I'm much more interested in doing right now. Right, so I can I can flip flop things. But if I make these times non negotiable, that means that now I can't negotiate with them either. So. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Is it palatable to become your own inflexible manager? Oh, I really like friendly Jersey boss. <laughs> I like cool Jersey boss. He's like, nah, let's get ice cream right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you seem to ha really get a lot done. Uh, and so, yeah, I wonder how much more this other Jersey boss would, uh, how, like, yeah, how, how much would it change the, yeah. the pro the output versus the feeling and the experience mm -hmm. yeah. of the yeah, production? Hmm. We'll see. I mean, I, I, and, and that's going to require me going back and like going through, you know, I need to measure, get a real measurement of like what the work I did last year cost in terms of time. And so that's going to require digging through those ETPs. And I, I haven't begun to do that yet. Um, I mean, we are only on the 2nd of January, 2020, but um, we had a bout with the flu this week. And so that like cut into a lot of time that Ann and I had set up to do our like yearly planning sessions together. So, so now it's going yeah. to be, yeah. Um, but what about you? Are you going to be doing any more digging through the archives? Oh yeah. I'm still mining. I, I'm still mining and uh, coming up with themes with the stuff I'm finding. Uh, there's like one interest since you shared a specific interesting thing. Um, it, I'm hunting like, so the theming is like what's emerging. So you have something really specific you're looking at, right? You're describing, mm -hmm. well, yeah. Like well, what makes sense as far as uh, planning out capacity? And I, th I should be doing some of that as well, but, but what there's things I'm reacting to in as far as, as far as my work and like how, um, like parts I've been wanting to add or, or that have been missing. And so some of it would be at just more illustrations in my different, um, in the workshops and illustrations that just sharing work more frequently, that kind of thing. And there's a part of it that, um, like I'm not really satisfied with my current style, right? So that there, there's a friction there. And mm. like, what even is my style? If I look at myself historically, I just reinvent myself every single project. Um, I the closest I was to having a style was when I stuck with Art Geek Zoo, the comic, for about four years. Mm -hmm. And I don't even like that style. I don't. I'm like, I don't know. It's okay. It was developing, but like, I don't know. There's things like I like sketchiness a lot. Like I want to embrace that more. And um, I also like it's so what I'm thinking of doing is, is doing some experiments around the um, like a cartoony rapid illustration style, mm. whatever that would be. I don't know, but like cartoony rapid illustration, it could be just 
a style for that context or whatever it is. But yeah, anyway, so that that's something where I'm like, ah, that's going to be on my radar. I'm going to work that into my projects where mm-hmm. um, like I may do warm up type work toward that where that's not a product in and of itself, but it's there to support my other products. Mm-hmm. And it will likely support all my other products. Um, so yeah, I'm still doing that gathering and, and, and theming. And some it, of it, it is like, some of it's like the evidence is in the, like my journals, it's just there. I just, I wrote that and I need to remember it. But other times it's sort of like, I'm just now, boom, boop, something popped in my head because like, and it explains a feeling I had all year. Mm. And that's yeah. where the cartooning thing came in. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Loose, loose and sketchy style. Um, it's, it's funny. Like I'm, I'm, I've, as you know, I've been approaching the same kind of thing, like with the Baron von Bear pitch I did that last October was like, how can I get this optimized to where it's as, it's as quick to produce as possible. Um, and then I landed on this, this look that where it's like, it's like, I would call it unfinished when I was in my younger days. Like this, it's not done. <laughs> you didn't finish the work, right? But it's like I, I think something that I noticed in a lot of the artists that I really admire, like Alex Toth, like Rick Leonardi, uh, Walt Simonson, is as their work matures. Oh, uh, Joe Kubert's a good example of this. As their work matures, um, they get more out of less, and it looks loose and sketchy on the surface but when you when you look at it closely it's like oh they used one line to make a nose one line and you get an entire nose out of that how did that happen right uh and but again as a young person i would look at that and be like it's not done they didn't finish the drawing it's it's too it's it's like a sketch but there's also a sense of sketchiness that can uh it can and i'm not saying mind does this necessarily but i'm saying like it can give the sense of um mastery Right, because they're not they they're not using much because they don't need to, and so like it becomes like a a, a race for efficiency, but then it, it gives it more of like a, a very natural sort of I don't know personal look. Absolutely, and that like and I don't know if I would have that kind of because um, that's like Olympic athlete level sketching in my opinion. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would like to have like and so who knows if that's where I start to trend. Fantastic. If not, I, I just want to see where it goes. And, yeah. uh, the, um, it's, it's like, there's something past the little H ball characters and there's something prior as far as on a continuum before, like the, like, let's say the last 20, um, RT zoo comics I made, right. Mm-hmm. There's something in between there that, probably is a pretty effective style and probably I could do interesting illustrations in an hour. Probably. Mm-hmm. Um, that probably also has, uh, I'm trying to find there, there's a, all right. So hold on. He's, he's off to find a visual example of what he's describing. These, these little things occurred to me. And uh, this is one of them. So like, just like the cartooning, I'm facing my notes and things pop into mind. Um, and I, this is one. I was little, literally staring at a floor rug when I thought of this. Art with honest and easy, clear details. That's visually, mm-hmm. uh, that's in, in the visuals and the pros, et cetera. That's what I wrote down. <laughs> so things that, uh, like capturing the, the feel of a forest, and having more of the essence of the forest, capturing a little throw rug and having the texture um, not go away, right? Mm-hmm. And having it be there and not be so um, like stagnant um, or plain. I want that. I could do that. And I just have mm-hmm. to make it, a, make it a point. I mean, that's, that's, why, that's why I like to do goals because I know I can, I can grow and adapt. So I'm pulling in, you know, these kind of, they're they're not fully evidence based goals, but I feel like the needs are credible. I want to underline that line. I think that's a great place to end it on. Is like that's why I like to make goals because I know I can grow and adapt. Right. That's 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 a lovely thought, and I think that's a it's a lovely way of thinking when it comes to making our work. You know. Cool. So I think we did a podcast, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Jersey. 
All right, pleasure. so we'll be back next week with uh, sort of, now that we look back, let's look forward. So then we tease out the next episode. Looking forward to 2020. Uh, so, you know, you can join us live. We record these things Thursdays, usually at noon Eastern time. But you can follow our Twitter account, you know, or or on the Discord to get news on when we're going to be broadcasting. Um, we stream live on Twitch, twitch.tv slash lean into art. Then collect that as a podcast at leadintoart.com and patreon.com slash leadintoart. We'll be back next week with another episode. Uh, until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leadintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And thank you. I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and I'm Rob Stenzinger, places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user Lean Into Art, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.